Good morning, Faith Harvest. Anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Would you stand with me? The psalmist in one Psalm 147 declares, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. How beautiful it is when we sing our praises to the beautiful God. For praise makes you lovely before Him and brings Him great delight. Is anyone ready to bring God great delight today? Lord, we praise you. We lift your name up. May our words, may our hands raise, may our dancing bring you great delight. In the name of Jesus, to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, amen and so be it. Would you join us in great praise today? There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life, and there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us, every battle you've already won, we've already won. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. And there is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Hey, show me. One thing he can do, show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Hey, show me one thing that's too hard, show me waters he can part. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Is possible. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, every dead thing, every dead thing is bound to rise. God, our Redeemer, he is faithful. He is faithful to revive. Oh, he will revive. Hey, we believe. Show Show me a mountain he can He's the God. He's the God of the breakthrough. And anything is possible. Yes. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can part. He's the God of the breakthrough. And anything is possible. It's possible. Come on, let's put our hands together with some belief and faith in this place today. In all of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Oh, all of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Oh, all of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment. Show me one thing you can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough. And anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can pop. 
He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. We believe it's possible.
the Lord spoke to me in this last week and I saw something. I know social media isn't always a good thing, but it was good for this one thing to tell me. And it spoke about one of God's promises and it said that believers will bow on one knee because they chose to surrender to the Lord. But non-believers or people who are of this world will eventually still have to be in that same posture, in that same position, bowed on one knee, saying, you are Christ the Lord. So how much do we love those non-believers? Because we don't want someone to have to, out of obligation or because God said one day they will bow and say, Christ is Lord. We want them to do that because that is their posture. That is their stance. That is their position. So today we might not always need something to lift our hands for and and cry out to God and ask for, but sometimes a non-believer needs us to do that for them and to stand in the gap in our posture means something to someone else. So before we go into a firm foundation, can we just create a firm foundation? Can we create a posture with hands lifted? Can we just tell him, great are you, Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Forever you will be holy and mighty and righteous. God, we choose today that this be our stance and this be our posture today, God, with holy hands lifted. God, we thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to worship you today, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you never 
Hallelujah. We just praise you. Let's just lift our hands. Amen. Let's invite the presence of God. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah.
of radical praise to the Lord Jesus this morning in this room. Come on. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. He hears your praise this morning. He hears your praises. Bless your name. It's no voice like your voice to the Father. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we believe that you are faithful and that you are just. That you hear us when we pray. That you hear us when we praise. That you hear the hearts cry of every person in this room this morning. You know every situation and you know every celebration. You're here and we worship you this morning because you never leave us and never forsake us. You are good and you are faithful, God. Anybody thankful for the goodness and the faithfulness of Jesus this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, turn and tell two or three people this morning. He hears you. Come on, tell some people around you this morning. He hears you. to see you this morning. You're looking amazing. Come on, look at somebody next to you and say, you are looking so good. Wow. All right. Some of you had too much fun with that. All right. So good to see you this morning. Seriously. And we have, do we have some of the most amazing leaders and volunteers around here at Faith Harvest? anywhere in the world we're so blessed come on give it a big round of applause for our amazing volunteers here at faith harvest you are amazing thank you so much thank you so much for all that you do every week to make this time special and to be able to minister to the people that god sends here for us to be able to reach and touch for the glory of god for the kingdom and we welcome all of you who are joining us by live stream. We're so thankful that you're here. Can you give a big welcome to all those that are joining us by live stream this morning? Praise God. As you prepare your offering this morning, as we do every Sunday at this time of the service, I just want to read a passage of Scripture to you that's so powerful from Proverbs chapter 3. 
It's a scripture that I'm sure you've heard many times. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. I'm going to skip down a couple verses to verse 9. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. And then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. How many believe God has a plan for your life for overflow? Amen. Praise God. So this morning, I want to pray over you as you prepare your offering. Father, this morning, I pray right now as we give during this time of the service, as we sow of that which you have blessed us with, the finances. Lord, it's a biblical thing all throughout the Old and New Testament. And so, Father, this morning as we give, we give us unto the Lord. And we thank you, Father, that every person in this room, we speak that there is a harvest of generosity in every one of our lives. That, Lord, that our vats are full and overflowing. As we sow into your kingdom, we bless your name and we thank you for this opportunity. And everybody said, amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Be blessed. While they're taking up the offering, I've got a couple of announcements for you. As I look around the room, isn't it exciting to see new visitors to Faith Harvest? Can we give our visitors a great big hand clap? We want to say to our visitors, welcome home. We are so glad you're with us. If you would do me a favor and look at the seat back pocket, there's a card called a Connect card. Please fill that out. Give it to the welcome desk. You can also uh, use the QR code. But when you do, let the welcome desk know. We have a gift for you, number one. And number two, our Connections Pastor, Pastor Kerry, would love to reach out to you. This Your information doesn't go on a mailing list. It just goes to him. He would actually like to prepare you a steak and lobster dinner. No, I'm just kidding. Just making sure you're paying attention. But he does want to give you a phone call at least or a text. Um, but Pastor Kerry will reach out to you. Yeah, he's falling on the floor back there. Sorry, PK. Also, next week, speaking of uh, meal, next week is our Meet the Family Lunch. Right after church, we have Moe's Restaurant catering next week. And I'm so excited about that. If you've never been to our Meet the Family Lunch, please come. You can sign up online. You can sign up on the at the welcome desk. Uh, tickets are twelve dollars, but everyone's going to eat after lunch after church anyway. Come and join us. We had sixty people last time. Lots of laughs and fun. If you're new to Faith Harvest, you've only been the last couple months at registration. Use the keyword guest and your lunch is on us. We'd love to treat you to lunch. So that's an even greater bonus. But if you've been here for a while, it's a great opportunity for you to meet new people and just enjoy some Mo's. Hey, amen. That's awesome. A lot of fun. You can sign up. Um, also, Wednesday night kicks off our spring growth groups. If you're not in a growth group yet, yeah, join after church, you can go come and meet and look over the material to uh, my left, your right over there, and sign up online, sign up at the welcome desk, and join us for growth groups. A great time for prayer, community, the word, all that good stuff. So you know what? If you missed what I was saying today, you can go online, you can go on the app, our website, come to the welcome desk or just uh, look for me in the lobby and I'd love to answer any questions. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the service, this anointing, and we're going to flow back into some worship.
Praise be to God. Can you stand me real quick? At the name of Jesus, every addiction must bow its knee. At the name of Jesus, every sickness must bow its knee. At the name of Jesus, fear and anxiety has to leave. At the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak your word this morning. We speak the words of life and truth. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness, God. You're faithful. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, in this room to speak to us today. We declare right now, as your word says, that all of hell will not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. A people who understand our purpose, understand our position, understand the call that you placed on our life, God. Many people that stand in this room with me right now that have incredible gifts, incredible skills, incredible talents. But Lord, there is a mighty anointing. There's an anointing. And Father, we speak to that anointing this morning and we say, rise up. Rise up. Anointing of the Holy Spirit upon each person in this room. And what you have gifted and anointed us to do for your glory, for your kingdom. It will be accomplished for the glory of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on, let's give God praise that what he promised will come to pass. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Look at somebody and say, before you're seated this morning, tell them, freedom is yours. Come on. Freedom is yours. You can be seated. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, you have been marked for freedom. God intends for you to walk in freedom. Amen. Whom the Son has set free is free and free. They are free indeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Unmistakably free. Well, we're in a series called Marked. Marked. It's a word that God spoke to my spirit for 2024 for this church and for this season, for this hour. I believe with all of my heart that God has marked this season. He's marked a people for this season. If you are in this room as a part of this family, God has marked you for this season, for this hour, for a very specific time. Something very significant that he wants to do in and through us during this season, always to bring glory and honor to him, right? The word marked means to be obvious, to be evident, to be noticeable, remarkable, pronounced or unmistakable. Last week I asked you to think about something in your life that God has done that it was unmistakably God. It had to be God. That's your testimony. This morning we're going to talk about your testimony a little bit. We're going to talk about what to do with your testimony. What do I do with this testimony that God has given me? Anybody in the room that has a testimony that God has set you free from something? Come on, lift your hand up really high, unashamed. If God set you free from something, you have a testimony this morning. All throughout this room. All right. Praise God. We're going to talk about what to do with your testimony today. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about what kind of season are we in. We're trying to all get on the same page that we believe and we actually conceive or see or understand what kind of season that we're living in and that it's a very, a season of urgency, a season of urgency for the church, for a response from the believer in the earth right now. 
And so we're talking about the seasons and we're talking about strategy. What do we do? You know, as we're casting vision for 2024, what is the strategy? How do we respond when we sense the season? What is the strategy of what God's saying that we should do during this season? And Luke 18, 8 says this, the Lord said, when I return to the earth, will I find faith? Will I find faith? What is he really saying there? When I return, will I find people that are acting as if they believe that my word is still true? That what I've spoken, that this is still the infallible, written word of God. That God can't fail. That it is inspired by God. And that God can't fail. Will I find faith when I return to the earth? I was studying this week from Romans chapter 3 for just a few, I was reading through that chapter. And as I was reading that chapter, there's a powerful, uh, there's some powerful verses there that I'm sure that would be real familiar to most all of you in the room. And one of those is for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Anybody agree with that? We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. But then it also says that we are saved by faith, not of works lest any man should boast. In this series, I've been trying to do something a little different in tying in the Old Testament with the New Testament for us to understand and see that God did not give us the New Covenant in order to eliminate or do away with the Old Covenant for us to forget about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, but God shows us things. There's things in the Old Testament that foreshadow events prophetic things that are going to take place that we read about in the New Testament and things that we're actually seeing taking place in our world today right now. So in Romans chapter 3, when it talks about we're saved by faith, I found this really cool verse that kind of ties all this in. I think it's maybe the last verse of that chapter, Romans 3, verse 31. It says, well then, if we emphasize faith, does that mean we forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. So what this passage is telling us is that the Old Testament is still relevant, but the New Testament is the new covenant of the believer. And here's where we sometimes get confused. It's because so many times in our lives we slip back over into the works mode. Because the Old Covenant was works-based, But we have a new covenant, a better covenant, one that is of grace by faith. But I want you to understand something. Just because we live, because there's a lot of verses in the New Testament that tell us this, just because we have this covenant of grace and this new covenant that is by faith does not mean that we no longer obey the commands of God's word. Because one thing that God teaches us all throughout Scripture is that consistently trying to teach us obedience. Obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice, one passage says. So God is constantly trying to show us the importance of obedience and obeying his word and following his commands. But still to live by faith and to trust him understanding that my works will never be good enough to justify me. But it's only by his grace that I'm justified. It's only by the blood of Jesus that I'm made right with God and my sins are forgiven. Everybody with me? So last week we took a peek into Joshua chapter 3 and we looked at some relevant things there, I believe, that are relevant to the season that we're living in right now. The Bible says there in Joshua 3 that it was harvest season. I believe we're in harvest season. God spoke to the people and he told them to leave their positions and they were going into a place or they were about to travel a path that they never traveled before. I believe we're living in a season right now that we're about to travel down a path that we have never traveled down before. I believe we as the church are going to see God do some things we've never seen God do before. I believe we're going to experience some things that maybe in our lifetime we've never seen God do. Anybody believe that? 
okay? That's by faith that we believe, we trust, and we believe that what God said in his word, it is true. It's harvest season. I believe also that God is going to take us from a place of the famous to the faithful, where he talked about in Acts chapter 2, that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. On my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in that time and in that hour, because I believe we're in that last time of the latter day reign of God's spirit. It's what I believe. And I believe we're marked for that season. New Testament, uh, Old Testament, where God told Esther through Mordecai, he said, who knows, maybe you came into the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows, maybe you were born into the earth for such a time as this. For this season that we are in right now, that God has something really special and significant that he wants to do in and through you in this hour right now. So Jordan, we talked about Jordan, what Jordan means. And one of the things that Jordan means, I love this 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 definition of the word Jordan, it means freedom. Freedom. So I want to talk about freedom for a bit because it was at this point when God's people stepped into freedom and they were about to go in and possess a promise that they'd been waiting for for hundreds of years to possess. A promise that God had given them and now they've been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, but now they've stepped across into freedom across the Jordan to see God do something that he's never done before. But here's one thing I want to make clear this morning, that God has freed you from something for something. I'm going to say that again. He hasn't just freed you from something. He's freed you from something for something. He freed you from pain for peace. He freed you from bondage for breakthrough. He freed you from humiliation for honor. He's freed you from something for something. He's freed us from captivity, the captivity of sin for opportunity that he has for us in our future. He's freed you from something for something. If we live our lives, here's something that's so important for us to get because this is really a lot of what this whole message is about this morning. If you live your life just living like God has freed me from something and not for something, You'll never walk out the purpose that God's intended you to walk out in the earth of being free. There was a purpose for which God set you free. He didn't just set you free to take you to heaven. He set you free for a purpose. He created you for a purpose. He gave us freedom with purpose is what I'm really trying to say. The word freedom means the power and the privilege to step into opportunities that God created for you. The power and the privilege to step into the opportunities that God created for you. God's created opportunities for every single one of us because he freed us from something for something. You were marked for freedom. And as I said this morning, the word mark means to be unmistakable, recognizable. That when people look at your life, they see something about you because they understand you were not just freed from something, you were freed for something, for a purpose that is very significant for what God... When, when, When Mordecai was reminding Esther that God freed her and brought her to this place in the palace, he's also reminding her that God freed you for something to stand in the gap for your people. So God's freed me from many different things, but he freed me for something very specific, and that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Before we go a little bit deeper, Exodus 3, something I want to kind of lay a foundation here for us to see. In Exodus 3, 13 through 15, Moses It says that Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, this is when God's telling Moses to go tell Pharaoh, set my people free. If I go tell the people of Israel and tell them that God, our ancestors, has sent me to you, they will ask me, what's his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for every generation. My name to remember even to 2024, Yahweh. So God tells Moses, when you go to the people of Israel and you go stand in front of Pharaoh, tell them this, I am sent you. Let's dig into that for a minute. What was God really saying when he said, I am has sent me? Here's what he's saying. I am with you today. I am will be with you tomorrow. Because Yahweh teaches us he is a relational God. So when he said, I am sent you. I am with you today. I will be with you tomorrow. Because I am a relational God. This is something important to see right here. Because sometimes we want God to bail us out. Any, anybody ever been in a situation you just need a bell out? Hey, God, got myself locked up again. <laughs> I'm in bondage again. I, I, yeah, Lord, I know you set me free one time. Yeah, yeah, there was that second time too. Yeah, yeah, I do remember I did it three times. Uh, but, Lord, I need you to bail me out again. And the Lord said, I'll be right there because I am. I am with you today. I will be with you tomorrow because I am a relational God. What was God saying? What was God really telling Moses to tell the people? I didn't just come to bail you out. I'm going to go with you. I will be with you because I'm a relational God. I am Yahweh. Don't forget this for every generation to come. I am not just here to bail you out because you got yourself bound up again. I will be with you every step of the way if you will believe me and if you will trust me because I am is with you. I am with you today because I have freed you from something and I freed you for something. So I, you're going to need me with you not just to be the one who freed you from something but the one who has freed you for something to be with you to do that something that I freed you for. As I prayed a while ago over an anointing that's on you, uh, many of us in, our, in this room have so many gifts and talents and skills and so many different, man, I, I, I get to have conversations with many of you and hear uh, the great things that God's using you to do and the, and the skills and gifts that God's given you, whether it's in business or in all the different things, ministry, all the things that God's using you to do and has, has skilled you to do. But I want to remind you that God has also anointed you. And that anointing that's on you is to do something that supersedes your skill and supersedes your ability that will cause bondage to break, that will cause people to be set free. And you can be doing a business deal, and in the middle of a business deal, someone gets saved. Someone give their life to Jesus. Someone be convicted of the sin that's in their heart because God has not just gifted you. He has anointed you. He has not just freed you from something. He's freed you for something to be a light shining in a dark world. He has anointed you to do something great for the kingdom of God. Don't ever underestimate the anointing that is on your life. God's a relational God. So if this, that was Old Testament. Well, we've talked Old Testament. That was New Testament, but it's referring to in Exodus 3. It's referring to here to um, Moses. But then New Testament, we see something in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It's called the Great Commission. And it says this, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And listen to what it says here in the Amplified. Help people to learn of me. Help people to believe in me. Help people 
to obey my commands. Because God's always teaching us obedience. Old and New Testament, he's teaching us if we will trust him and obey him. Faith without works, what is works? It's obedience. Obey him. He said, teach people. This is making disciples. Help people learn about me. Help people who are having trouble believing me to be able to trust me. And then help people to learn how to obey my word. That's what making disciples is. It's really those three things, making disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And lo, listen to this, I am. You see that? I am that we saw in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus where God said, tell them, I am. I'm with you today. I'll be with you tomorrow because I am a relational God. All of a sudden now God says that same thing again here in, in Matthew chapter 28. I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances, on every occasion, and even to the end of the age. This is the one thing that I really am trying to stress this morning of understanding what making disciples is about. You were freed from something for something. And really, in this room right now, there's th there, really, biblically, there should only be three different groups of people in the room. Somebody who's an unbeliever, somebody who is a new believer, and someone who is making disciples. I'm going to say that again. In this room, there's only three groups of people. Someone who's an unbeliever who hasn't yet put their trust in Jesus, who we believe before we leave today, will. Secondly, there's the person who's just dedicated their life to follow Christ. And thirdly, there's disciple makers. Because this is a great commission. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Go make disciples. Oh boy, you guys were really rolling with me, but all of a sudden you got quiet. So So I got to do something. Yep, we got to do something. There's urgency that we do something. Go make disciples. Here's one thing you need to understand. Don't take this back to Old Testament. Because if you take it back to Old Testament, oh, I got to make disciples. Let me check that box. Make disciples. And you can make making disciples religious. But making disciples to be, to do a good work and be religious is called production. God didn't call you to the production business. But relationship, he said, I am a relational God. So I am with you today and I'll be with you tomorrow because I'm a relational God. You know what a disciple maker says? I'm with you today, I'll be with you tomorrow because I'm relational, because I serve a relational God. And the one who is on the inside of me has made me a relational disciple maker. He has made me one because I am, I will be with you today and I will be with you tomorrow because I am relational, because I serve a relational God. But relationship is about reproduction. God called us not to produce, but reproduce. And we've been talking a lot about Old and New Testament. And that's why I want to bring a balance right here this morning real quick. Don't forget, you are not called to be a part of the Old Covenant. You're called to be a part of a New Covenant which means you are now a disciple maker and you have now the opportunity and the responsibility to go forth and make disciples of all nations, yes. teaching them how to learn of me, believe in me, yes. and obey me because I was freed from something, for something, to make disciples. That's what Jesus told us. That was his last word to his disciples before he left here was go make disciples. This, this is the last couple of things I want to say real quick. And then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Jim for a few minutes to share some things with you. But I want you to hear something in Galatians 5.1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again 
in slavery to the law. Christ has set you free. Stay free. You know what making disciples is? Helping people stay free. You know what the saddest thing in the world is? Is somebody who gets so on fire for Jesus and they give their life to God and they're so fired up and want to do something for God and all of a sudden Satan comes and with temptation he begins to lure them back into their past and all of a sudden a few weeks they're gone and they've gone back to the same lifestyle that they were living because they didn't know how to stay free. You know what the church's greatest responsibility is? Help people stay free. And it's not the pastor's job or the pastoral team's job. It's our job. Jesus released this commission to the church. Make disciples of all nations. Pray for one another. Lay hands on one another. Encourage one another. We're one body and we fit together and we all all have different gifts and different talents, different purposes, and we encourage one another and we strengthen one another. Go make disciples. Be relational. It's not a production thing. It's a reproduction thing. It happens because of relationship. It happens because of love for one another. Not just committing God's word to memory, but learning how to do what God said in his word is what we should do. Can you watch this video with us real quick? And then Pastor Jim is going to come and share. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. It's it, It was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You, 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 you study right, it, you memorize it. You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do. He tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many Pastor people Brad in the, our churches are actually making disciples? For they memorized it. it. As part of his messages, the last you know, when I tell my week, daughter, it is so hey, hey, Rach, go clean your room. Um, understand that it's she doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. Idea of being this you said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. Is so urgent. Um, did we get it or no? That's okay. You guys can take it. When I was. <laughs> My friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned right, my let's room. Let's go to the scripture. Let's just go to the first scripture um, that I wanted to, to share with you guys. She um, knows better than that. Is this and so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one let's day start here. and How many quote everything the that he said? The Christ that Pastor Brad was just talking about is a treasure. Can we all start there for just a minute? What Christ has set you free from is 100% a treasure. In fact, Jesus says uh, there's two parables that he talks about on this subject that we can see in Matthew 13 um, where he talks about it being a treasure and how important that is because he is that treasure. That treasure is something that 
Well, I'll just read it. Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy that field. That's pretty strong. That's pretty urgent, wouldn't you say? That he wanted that treasure. He knew that field was so valuable that he sold everything. In, in verse 45, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is like, if you didn't pick up on that, let me tell you again another story very similar. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered the pearl of great price, in other words, the most expensive pearl he could ever find, what did he do? He sold everything he owned and bought it. That shows how important that treasure is. And when Jesus says your freedom in me, your salvation, your discipleship in me should be that urgent. Now, you guys are like, I don't get pearls. I don't get treasures in a field. Let me put it this way. In 2017, the most expensive painting in the world, Salvador Munde, the savior of the world painting by Leonardo da Vinci sold to a private owner for $450 million. True story. You can Google it. Not right now. Listen to me. If I continued the story and said, by the way, that private owner put that painting behind another painting in a frame and donated it to a Goodwill here in the Wake Forest, Raleigh area, and I know that for a fact, do you realize that everyone would be peeling out of here right now? <laughs> selling, getting to the ATMs to get all the cash they could go to get to where, to the Goodwills to buy that painting, to buy all, how many would buy all the paintings? And just start taking it till you saw the picture of Jesus, the Savior of the world, painting because it was $450 million. Jesus is using this story to explain that He is that treasure. He is that Savior of the world. His love is radical. He's saying, you're my disciple. This is a radical situation. I'm giving you everything you need. I'm the water. I'm the freedom. I'm the uh, living water. I've got, I will give you everything you need. Young people, Jesus is everything you need. He is the treasure, the pearl of great price, the most expensive anything you could ever buy. He is worth giving your life for. Ooh. What do, wait, wait, why do you say that? Because Jesus just said it in his stories. We have to give everything we have. We have to sell all we have. We have to give everything to him. Do we really believe that? It's a radical love, but it's also a radical call. Do you understand the most glorious reason you exist? Do I have any Christians in here bold enough to at least say I'm a Christian? Raise your hand. All right, well, guess what? If you have your hand raised, the most glorious reason you exist is for the proclamation of the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, Church of Jesus Christ, we are plan A for this world. There is no plan B. It is time to get radical. It is time to get urgent, as Pastor Brad is saying. And it's time to do what Jesus says to do. Because the third radical is it's a radical obedience to do what the Jesus has told us to do. Pastor Brad just said it. Our commission is to do what? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is the great commission. What is a commission? A commission is a command that has authority. He, Pastor Brad read Matthew 28. Guess what? It's not only just in Matthew. It's in Mark. It's in Luke. It's in John. How many understand that if every one of the apostles, all 12 of the apostle, apostles uh, were were died for the gospel message, how urgent it is for you and I to live out in that obedience? to do the same. 
You raised your hand. You said that you are a professing Christian. It's time to match. And I'm preaching to myself. It's time to match our obedience with that call. That video we were going to show you was Francis Chan t- talking about, and uh, we can give you the link later, but it's him telling the story if he told his son to go clean his room, and the son came back in an hour and said, hey, dad, guess what? I remember what you said. You said, son, go clean your room. And then he's like, you know what else? I went ahead and memorized what you said in Greek. In fact, I'm going to have a group study. All my friends are coming over. And we are going to talk about cleaning your room and what that looks like. Sadly, the point of that story is that in the church world today, we get the idea of if we just talk about Jesus, if we just read this or we do that or we come to church, that's Christianity. And Jesus is saying, I've told you what to do. Pastor Brad just radically told us what to do. Every one of us in here. It's time for us to reach those lost people out there and show them, demonstrate the kingdom of God in this world. How many of you know one lost person who doesn't proclaim Jesus? That person needs you to live the life, to be a disciple, and that's radical obedience, a radical call. There is no plan B. This What Pastor Brad is laying out here is plan A. It's a radical urgency that we've heard him talk about. And you might be like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, this is a lot. Give up everything. That, that's Jesus' story, not ours. Yes, give up everything. To be a disciple maker. And you might be like, well, I'm, I, I'm not, that's a lot. I don't even know what that means. Well, here's where we're here to help you because our job is to equip. Not to do every, all the discipleship. It's to equip everyone here to do it. It is intentional. Discipleship is this. Intentionally, relationally, multiplying Christ-like followers. It's that simple. I'm a Christian. I want you to be a Christian. I'm going to develop, intentionally develop a relationship with you to talk about Jesus. There's discipleship, ladies and gentlemen. How many can talk to someone? I hope, well, not many people in here can talk to people. All right, I was thought we were talking here. We can all talk to someone. How many can live their life where it displays Christ? We all can do that. That's what Jesus is talking where the rubber meets the road. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to offer an equipping. For the next six months, we've laid out a program called Deeper Walk Discipleship. It's been a commission from Pastor Brad for us to do. It is game-changing in this discipleship-making world. For the next six months, starting next Sunday... From 10 to 10.45, we are going to meet together to talk about what discipleship means, how to read your Bible, and Christian doctrines. Along with that, there's three things that are going to help equip you. If I wanted to be a, 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 any, any profession, I would need to be equipped to do it. Jesus wants us as the church to help everyone in here become a disciple maker. So we're going to learn about what discipleship is, basic Christian beliefs, and we're going to do that together. We have books. We have material. We're going to study it together. One chapter a week. It's not a lot. One chapter a week. It took me 45 minutes, and I don't get a lot of things. So if I can do it, you can definitely do it. The comprehension part, we're going to comprehend what the material is. We're going to do it in community. From 10 to 10.45, right before church, we're going to meet together. We're just going to talk about it, answer questions. You don't have to go some theological um, rendition of what you learned. We're just going to be like, what did this mean? And then third, we're going to coach. We have mentors available who's just going to check in and say, hey, how's it going? 
How's, your, how's the study of what you're doing going? How, how's life going? Can I pray for you? In fact, those folks are in here, the ones that are starting. Now, here's the goal. The end goal is for at the end of the six months, you're equipped. And you're going to reach two or three people. As people come to know Jesus in this church, I'm going to say, hey, let me partner you with so-and-so. And they're going to walk you through discipleship. This friendship. It's amazing plan that Jesus didn't just give to Faith Harvest. He gave it to the church 2,000 years ago. Go and make disciples. Teaching them how to be like me. Intentionally. So we, if you want more, if you want to learn about this, um, I would all my disciple makers, my mentors stand up real quick. We have Allison right here, Dave, Ricky, Scotty, where are you guys at? Can we give them a great big hand clap? They're going to, <clears throat> they are committed and we prayed together for the next six months to be available to you to walk through this material. Now, are we great at this? We don't know. We've never done this before. Our goal, we talked about it this morning, is just to stay one chapter ahead and help walk you through this. Walk each other through it. It's, it's humbling. It's beautiful. And it's going to be amazing. Now, there is a church we got the material from, Highlands Church in Arizona. We're going to watch. They're ahead of us. They're doing this with their disciples and their disciple makers. And I thought, you know what? We've put a lot on you as far as a disciple program. It's urgent. It's radical love. It's radical call. It's radical obedience. But let me give you the fruit of it. Would you guys like to see at least what the outcome is? Let's watch a quick video if we can. Um, if we can get that video up and make sure it's working. And you'll see what that looks like. I wanted to be discipled because I'm young, newly wed, and just navigating through some things in life. I was a fairly new Christian. I knew that I needed to get reconnected. <laughs> we were acquaintances. We were in the same Bible study. He just needed somebody to come alongside him. The older generation pouring into the younger generation, showing us, hey, how do we strive for holiness? How do we strive for righteousness in our lives? And what does that look like? To have someone who's like invested in your spiritual growth, you just kind of have this morning. I have no idea how much of an impact that's going to make until you. In Luke 5, and this is what's so important, we have a discipleship program that we're bringing together, something that we are doing that God's instructed us to do. It's real important that we do what God asks us to do. So we're taking this step of faith to step forward and do what God's asked us to do. And in doing that, we know that God is going to do what we can't do, right? That's what he always asks us. You do what you can do. I'll do what you can't do. So in Luke 5, Jesus shows up on the boat of Simon Peter, who is not a disciple of Christ. And what does he do? He performs a miracle. He fills his boat with fish. Peter falls on his face before Jesus and repents. And says, Lord, I don't deserve you to be on my boat. And Jesus said, from now on, you'll be fishing for men. God has called us. And here's the beautiful thing about making disciples. As Pastor Jim said, maybe some things we think I don't know enough to make disciples. Can I encourage you that when you step out in faith to share your testimony, I believe that God shows up unmistakably to perform his word. There have been times when I said to someone just standing in my own driveway who was battling with something I battled with before, and I say, can I pray for you? I, I can't heal anybody, but I serve one who can. And I say, can I just pray with you? That God, God healed me of that. Can I pray for you? Because I believe God will heal you of that. And I just touch them, pray for them, trust God to do something supernatural. You know what? When God does something supernatural, somebody gets inquisitive, wants to ask questions. Hey, what just happened? I just felt something. Whew. Never felt that, never felt that before. I just felt like something just happened because God will supernaturally show up 
when we in faith obey his word. And that's not just for me. That's for every single one of us in this room. That when you obey God's word and you really start fishing for men. You know, to fish, you got to go where water is. To fish, you got to go where fish are. And a real fisherman knows where the fish are. The big fish. If you're a fisherman of men, then God's anointed you to be a disciple maker. Love some people, help some people, share your story. It's urgent. It's urgent. Will you bow your heads with me just a minute? As I said earlier, there's one group of people that are in this room. That one group is those who have not yet believed on Jesus to be their Savior. There's the believer, the new believer, and then there's the disciple maker. If you are in this room and you've not accepted Jesus to be your Savior, or maybe Satan's just telling you and just whispering in your ear, telling you you're not good enough, you're not faithful enough, you can't. Can I tell you this morning, he's a liar, he's defeated. If you just respond right now by just lifting your hand and saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. The Lord, not just the one to bail me out. I want a relationship. If that's you, can you just lift your hand right now and say, Pastor, will you please pray for me? I want to know Jesus. I want to know him as my Savior. Yes, thank you. I saw that hand. God bless you. Yes, thank you. Anyone else in the room to just lift your hand right now and say, that's me. God loves you. He's rich in mercy. Can I get you to pray this prayer with me right now? You're not saved by your works. You're saved by faith through the grace of Jesus. So right now, we're going to pray a prayer. And by praying this prayer, as you believe and you trust, you right now become a child of God. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, let's all pray it together. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I have sinned. And I need you to forgive me I'm desperate for you to forgive me I ask you to come into my heart I ask you to be my savior I believe you died for me and I believe you rose again so that I can have life so right now I confess you as my Lord and my savior in Jesus name Amen. Well, heads are bowed, still eyes closed just for a minute. If you're in this room and you're a new believer, you haven't been serving God very long, can you just lift your hand right now? Come on. Yeah, all throughout the room. Come on. I haven't been serving God very long. Maybe it's just the last few months or a year. Come on, all throughout the room. I haven't been serving God that long. New believers, that's, that's awesome, that's awesome. Thank God. Come on, let's celebrate these new believers that are in the room this morning. Here's what we're going to do as an act of faith in what we just have been taught because it's urgent. We're going to pray for one another here. It starts here and it moves out into the world. And so if we can't pray for one another in here, we can't encourage the new believer in here, and we can't lead someone towards Jesus here, we're going to have a hard time doing it out there where people are not responding correctly. So we can be the disciple makers that God's called us to be. You are powerful. You are anointed to do this. You are anointed to do this. So can you stay on your feet with me real quick? I'm going to invite everybody that will to come gather as close as you can around this altar real quick. Come on, everybody come. As close to the altar as you can come.